If you've got your Bibles, turn with me again uh, to Philippians chapter 4. Little boy was riding home from church on a Sunday morning with his parents, and he announced to them that he was going to grow up and be the pastor. And they said, that's great. And so why are, what changed your mind or what convinced you to do that? Honey, you know we'll support you in anything you want to do, but why do you want to be a pastor? Little guy said, well, I think it'd be more fun to stand up and yell than to sit there and listen. <laughs> stand up and yell. Um, he almost had it right. Look at verse 1 with me, if you would. Paul gives this command. He says to them that they are to stand firm. Uh, and he talks about two issues about which they are to stand firm. As I said, I think this passage is eminently practical. There are two things here that he wants to communicate. He's dealing with the issue of anger in the church in Philippi, and he's dealing with the issue of anxiety. And that's endemic to the human condition. That's, that's what our life is. I mean, there are things about which we get angry. There are things about which we worry, things over which we have no control. And how is it that we are to respond to these things? Um, anger deals or, or causes conflict and divisions in the church. And anxiety causes inner conflict, inner turmoil despair, sometimes despondency or depression. And so Paul takes on these things in our passage this morning. He begins with the word, therefore. Whenever you see a therefore, find out what it's there, find for. Out what it's there for. Okay, it's a reminder that everything that is in this letter, he wants you to kind of remember and to think about as he now begins to talk about anger and anxiety. And so he will refer to things that he's already talked about. Therefore, he says, my brothers whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown. Again, I think I said it two weeks ago, but this is his favorite church. Uh, this is the church with the fewest problems. This is the church that, with the fewest headaches. This was a generous church. If Paul was going to retire somewhere, he'd retire to Philippi. Uh, he wouldn't go to Corinth. Uh, he, he wouldn't go to some of those other churches. You know, Paul had a, a lot to deal with. Paul is, this is a prison epistle. Paul is writing from jail in Rome. And he's giving advice to people that are free to roam the streets, free to go here, hither, and yon, and do what they want to do. And he is bound uh, to one of the Praetorian Guard. Thank you, Susan. I couldn't remember that two weeks ago, Praetorian Guard. It's the secret service that guards the Caesar. And he's in Rome, and he's chained to one of Caesar's personal guards. And he's giving advice. He has been, he's old now, he's been worn down by his missionary travels and he's tired. And those things can be read about in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He enumerates the struggles and the trials through which he has come. And he appeals to his manner of life. 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he tells the Corinthians, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Are you prepared to tell somebody else to imitate you? Paul had no worries, no compunction about doing that. In fact, he says it in our, in our text this morning that we are to imitate him. Therefore, who, uh, you are my joy and my crown. Stand firm in the Lord. And what's this picture of standing firm? It might come from Psalm 1. Be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water which yields its fruit and its season and its leaf doesn't wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. Or it could be from Ephesians 6, the one clad in the full armor of God, standing firm against the schemes of the devil and dodging the fiery darts that the devil is shooting at you. Um, but Paul wants us to stand firm. And he wants us to stand firm with, regarding these two issues, anger and uh, anxiety. Now, anger, it shouldn't surprise us. Again, this is to be human. And so why, why should we be surprised to find it in the scriptures? And why should we be surprised to find it in the church? Um, so Paul then goes on. He says, I entreat Yodia and entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of the fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. I read a lot of commentaries in preparation for a message, and some of this stuff cracks me up. Um, 
how, is, how are these women described? They are Paul's co-workers. They are Paul's fellow workers. What does that mean? That means they were evangelists. That means that they were church planters. That means they were leaders in their church. But commentators are men, typically, and they go through these mental gymnastics in order. We know women can't lead, so it can't, it can't mean that. But that's what it says. But it can't mean that. So um, some versions change the name of Yodia to Iodias, making him a man. And Syntyche is his wife. And then they write all reams of paper about this couple that are having this fight in the church in Philippi. Paul's doing marriage counseling by a letter in front of the whole church. Honest to Pete. Um, they are his fellow workers. They are his co-workers. They are leaders in the church. This is why Paul is addressing it publicly, because what happens when leaders in the church, what happens when pastors are butting heads with one another? It creates division. It creates turmoil. It creates conflict. And so Paul is going to address this issue. And so he does. And he asks, here's another one that makes me laugh. He asks the true companion to help him to resolve this issue. And so, of course, it's got to be Timothy or Epaphroditus or uh, Luke. Um, but it couldn't be the pastor of the church, who is Lydia, uh, Acts chapter 16. They meet in her home, and she's the pastor of the church. But again, women can't be pastors, so he wouldn't ask her probably why he used the circumlocution that he doesn't name her name because in a patriarchal society there are people who will get their backs up about the idea of women pastors but his true companion is called on here to intercede on behalf of these two ladies now what's noteworthy here is that um, Paul, it's the way that Paul handles this Paul sets them up in a beautiful way if you go back to chapter 2 Paul says to them, have this attitude in yourselves which was in Christ. Do nothing, verse 3 and 4, from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility. Consider the other person more important than yourself. Imagine you're Yodia and Syntyche in the church, and you guys are butting heads with one another, and, and the, they're reading the letter. They don't do it the way we do it. They would stand at the pulpit, at the lectern, and they would read the entire letter in one sitting. They don't just do a few verses here at a time. They do the whole letter. And so he's setting them up with how we are to put other people's needs ahead of our own concerns, our own wants, our own desires. And then he gives the supreme example. He says, look at Christ who did not regard equality with God. Chapter 2, a thing to be grasped, be held on to. He emptied himself. He emptied himself of his prerogatives of God. And he became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so he gives that example. And then he gives another example. He talks about uh, Timothy and Epaphroditus. Look at chapter 2, verse 20, 21 with me, if you would. Here's what he says about Timothy. Again, setting them up. For I have no one like Timothy who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare because they all seek their own interests. And here are Yodia and Syntyche in the church hearing about Timothy, who's also a co-worker and a fellow worker along with Paul. Whatever is said about Timothy and Epaphroditus in this passage applies also to these two women. He's, they have the same titles. They have the same job description. And then he gives the example of Epaphroditus. Look down at chapter 2, verse 29. So receive Epaphroditus in the Lord with all joy and honor, and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete that which was lacking in, your, in service to me. So he served the church in Philippi, and he's worthy of honor for that reason. And that these are the examples that Paul is citing as he now comes to the final exhortations, as he comes to the end of his letter, and he has to deal with these two issues. So he's got these two women that are butting heads. He calls for somebody to come in and to mediate that, to help them. Also, he's dealing with an issue of church discipline. A true church exists where the gospel is rightly preached, where the sacraments are rightly celebrated, and where there exists church discipline. If you don't have those three elements, you don't have a church. You have uh, a social club. Um, often the one that's missing, particularly in our day and time, is church discipline. 
people don't submit to it, people don't want to hear about it, and you try to discipline somebody and they quit the church and they go to the church up the street or they go to the church down the street. And those churches are just thrilled to have a new member, so they never inquire as, did you leave your previous church under a cloud? Are you under discipline? Um, is there an issue that needs to be resolved before we can receive you into membership in our church? And those are questions that don't get asked. But Paul takes it head on here with these two women. And so he is entreating them to come together. Now, if you'll turn back again to chapter 1, verse 27, he's using language, again, therefore, he's using language that he's already used. Verse 27, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I am absent, I may hear of you, that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. And here in our passage, that's what he says. These ladies have labored side by side with me for the sake of the gospel. He's using virtually the same language, and he's trying to drive home the point. What he's striving for is the unity of the church, that we need to be one in purpose. We need to be one in mission. We need to be one in Christ under the lordship and the headship of Christ. But it isn't uniformity. Um, on secondary issues, churches, there's freedom in Christ to have a disagreement about eschatology, a freedom in Christ to have a difference of opinion about the mode or method of baptism. Um, these are things that churches often separate over, but we have chosen not to separate and to extend grace to one another in these secondary and tertiary doctrines. And so Paul is calling on them to be unified, to be one, to, to, because the church represents God and the people of God in the community. In uh, John chapter 13, the verses 34 and 35, Jesus gives a new commandment to his disciples. It's a new commandment that he gives to us. Love one another. And then he says, by loving one another, all men will know that you are my disciples. So this has everything to do with the internal dynamics of the church. There needs to be peace and unity. And the external witness of the church to the community beyond it. If there was a church where people actually loved one another and cared for one another, would the community stand up and take note of that? I mean, that's something that's missing in our world. And it's what the church has to offer to a hurting and broken world. There's plenty of hurt and brokenness out there. We don't need more hurt and brokenness in here. Uh, we need to strive for the unity of the body. Um, so he deals first with the issue of anger, and then in verses uh, 4 through 7, Paul writes this, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I will say rejoice. All right, again, Paul is in prison. He's writing to people that are free to come and go, and he's reminding them of the joy that they have in the relationship they have with Christ. And he's calling on them to rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God that passes understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. To worry is, again, to be human. I ask Cheryl, who's going to push my wheelchair when I get old? And Cheryl says, well, that's a problem for your next wife. <laughs> She, she fully de uh, intends to predecease me, and so, um, honey, who's going to supervise me when I get old? Matt, that's a problem for your next wife. Um, and so, we, you know, worry, anxiety, what's going to happen and what will the future bring? Uh, Paul has those worries. He's in jail, and he could be brutally executed at any moment. And he's the one reminding them to rejoice. He's the one reminding them that they are in Christ and that that's where their joy is found. Uh, my spiritual director loves to sail. And he uses this illustration all the time. Um, it, on the water, it could be a beautiful sunny day with a light breeze. And so the sailboat can go where he wants. he's directing the sailboat to go. And it's just a gorgeous day on the water. Or and he's been on the boat in the midst of storms when the boat is being lashed by rain and waves and, and you know, ripped apart. But when he drops the anchor overboard, there is no weather down where the anchor is. 
and Jesus is our sole anchor, and that we are to be anchored to Christ, and then the circumstances, and then the situation of life no longer takes precedence in our lives, but that we are anchored to Christ, and that Christ can be counted on to keep us safe, not not always the way that we might want or expect. I mean, again, Paul could, is expecting the possibility of an imminent execution. Safety in Christ doesn't mean that you won't experience trials, that you won't experience pain. I do a book club with my friends from high school, and uh, we were having that conversation yesterday morning here. I was upstairs in my office, it's a Zoom call, and guys, I went to high school, vehemently disagreeing with me about, you know, he expects a pre-wrath rapture and Christians aren't going to have any hard times in their life. I'm like, are you nuts? How many of you here sitting this morning have experienced hard times in your life? Experienced trials and pains and difficulties? Hello? It doesn't mean that we live a life of ease. It means that when we're going through something, Christ is going through that thing along with us. And that that's what being anchored to Christ means. That He is with us in the good things and He's with us in the hard things. And that, that all of that is a part of life. We've, we've done together in recent time, we've done 1 Peter, we've done James, we've done Romans, we're doing Philippians. Every one of those letters talks about suffering. Why is it that middle-class Americans flee from suffering, don't want to talk about suffering, pretend suffering doesn't happen? Of course it does. You all just raised your hands. Of course it does. The scriptures are wonderful because they're true to life. They tell us what's real. It's not fairy tale. It's not you know, uh, something in the sweet by and by. Um, it, it deals with where we are. And anxiety is a part of where we are. We worry about those things that we can't control. That's the blessing of COVID. Did it not teach us that we don't have any control? What a great lesson. And that's a lesson that we need to know and learn and understand, that we need to take it in and pay attention to. We don't control the future, but we know who does. We aren't in control of our lives. I mean, I could have cancer right now and not know it. Uh, we're not in control of any of those things. I could fall over right now and, uh, with a heart attack. That could happen. And we're not in control. And so what do we do in the face of we're not in control? Do nothing from, uh, I'm sorry, be anxious for nothing. And the solution, Paul says, is very simple. When you get worried, when you're experiencing anxiety, take a moment, take a deep breath. How is my body feeling? Am I stressed? Are my shoulders tight? Is my neck tight? Am I, am I sick to my stomach? Take an inventory of how you are feeling in your body and in your emotions. And if you find that you have anxiety, Paul says, pray. Pray. Just It's communication with God. God, I don't know what's going on, but I'm uptight. And I don't know why I'm uptight. And so all of these trials, all of these pains, all of these difficulties are opportunities for us to go to our Heavenly Father and lay them at His feet. And what's the upshot? He says, pray with prayers and supplications or petitions. To pray specifically. If there's a particular thing that's going on in your life, to pray about it and be particular and to be precise about your prayers. And then what do we receive from that? God's peace, which passes understanding. Now, again, Jesus says in John 14, verse 27, uh, peace I give to you, not peace as the world gives. Freedom from pains, freedom from trials, that's what we want. Peace I give to you, not as the world gives, but he gives us a peace which passes all understanding. And so we come to terms with the things that are causing us worry and anxiety, and we come to terms with the reality of the struggles that all of us faith, face in life. And so Paul is doing nothing but just reminding them of what they already know to be true. These are his disciples. These, these are his kids. And he is holding forth on these issues of life that he's dealing with. And he closes up that section with the peace that gives peace that passes understanding. And that causes him to think of something else. So let's look together then at 8 and 9. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think on these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, 
Practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. This is a list of classical virtues. Thinking positive thoughts. Now he's not saying be Norman Vincent Peale and uh, the power of positive thinking and if you were just optimistic then your life would be a lot easier and things would go more smoothly. Um, but he is saying that these are things that not only Christians understand but this could be written by a pagan philosopher. We all have a, a similar understanding for excellence, a similar understanding of beauty or at least we used to. Um, we understood those things, and it, it should be that way, because what is it that we believe? We live in a broken and fallen world, and that because God loves us, he comes to us and he communicates to us in a way that we can understand. He uses words that we use in order that we might understand what his heart is and where he is coming from. And so Paul is telling them, have the mind of Christ. Whatever is good, whatever is true, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, think about your blessings. Think about the way, many ways God has shown up in your life and think about those. And then I love this next section, verse 9. We don't come down from heaven fully formed. And we don't come to faith in Jesus and we say the sinner's prayer and then our life is all roses. Um, Paul says, no, practice these things. This requires work. It requires effort. Earlier in the letter, therefore, Earlier in the letter, he said, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. It's something he's already given us. It's already there, but it's on us to work it out. It's for us to practice this, and not individually, but we do it communally. I love the verse that Joe read about the men's ministry. We are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but we are to encourage one another, to build one another up, to spur one another to love and good deeds. This is Paul's call to the Philippians. So Paul is closing this letter with these final exhortations, reminding us of the human condition, reminding us that the way to deal with anger is to seek help, bring in a companion, seek remediation, seek reconciliation, try to get them on the same page. For what purpose? To bring unity to the church. Anything that frays at the fabric of the community is a thing that needs to be dealt with. And that's what Paul is talking about here and then about anxiety. When we're anxious, when we're worried, particularly about those things that we can't control, then we are to pray. And the more worried and the more anxious we are, the more we pray. And what does it do? It builds our relationship with Christ, which after all, is what this whole thing is about. Amen.